Uh oh. Boom. 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 I have to, traders, I have to realize that um, I have to go live actually a little bit before time because there's such a, a such a delay and a lag right <laughs> that um it starts the live later than the time i really want to start so i gotta do it like a minute or so ahead of time nothing wrong with being a minute or so early in the case right here colombian coffee whoo yeah hmm so good. So good. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome, my babies, my traders, my people. Mi gente hermosa. All right, I love it. Boom, from India. Where are you guys pl plugging in from? Wow, see India here? Wow, it's late there. Wow, that's incredible. I love it. Okay. I see some more and more people piling in. I love it. Let's do this. I want your questions. I want your questions, guys. And if you know what I'm going to do, let me let me pull this down here a little bit now. What I want to do, traders, is um, I want this to be I want this to be open. I want it to be on the fly. Uh, nothing planned at this particular point far as far as taking your questions. So. I'm watching your comments as they kind of flow on my screen here. Um, what I'm going to also do is I'm going to have up my my um, I'm going to have up my Twitter as well. So what I want to do, guys, if I can, is I want to show you. Um, let me see if I can do this properly. Let's see if I do this right. All right. Uh, let's see. Does that show up like this? Let me see. Boom. Okay, so I want to show you my Twitter, right? Uh, everything for, for me, for the most part, traders, you can find me at OLVelez007. That's my handle for virtually all social media. And I'm going to have that up because I tend to really take the vast majority of questions that come to me from all different sides from my Twitter account. It's just so, so much easier for me. To track so I'm gonna have that and um, if you really if you really want one of your uh, questions answered right on the fly here just why don't you type me there or what have you but um, that's cool so I'm going to go back to uh oh gotta go back to things here I want to make sure that I get as um, many in during this session as possible but there might be some questions that you ask that really deserve some very special time associated with it so um, if it's something i can answer quickly and i think that that does the job quickly then fine but um, if it's something that i think will benefit the audience here and the world obviously, because this becomes an electronic footprint or a piece of material that lasts forever, um, then I'm going to spend a little bit of time delving into it if I think it deserves that, okay? All right, so guys, yeah, from all over the world here, Virginia, India, wow, lots of people from India, that's amazing, all right, especially given the time now for you guys, all right, awesome. Uh now, someone here is asking about, I see from Nishe is asking, Oliver, can we use your strategies like the Fabulous Four strategy you teach on the five-minute time frame? Now, I'm not going to go into specifics about what the Fabulous Four is, um, but I will say this, that one of the things I think that all of my followers, all of my traders need to understand is that I will never teach you anything that is not universally applied across all financial markets and across all time frames. This is very important to understand. It does not matter what you trade. 
And it doesn't matter whether you're a short-term trader, intermediate-term trader, long-term trader, forever trader. Listen to me carefully, traders. Listen to me carefully. This is important. We are not really trading, essentially, the financial items. We're not really trading stocks. We're trading the activity of people who trade stocks, who play stocks. So we're really trading people's activity. We're not trading cryptocurrencies. We're trading people's activity in cryptocurrencies. So we're not trading options. We're not trading bonds. We're not trading Forex. We're trading the activity that actually moves those financial items. Now, here's the essential point you need to understand. What's the common denominator in all financial markets, buying and selling? We're, play, we're trading the relationship between buying and selling in all markets. Buying and selling is done predominantly by human beings and the, the products that they create, like algorithms, it still comes from human beings. So human being, the activity of human beings run through all markets. Just because you change a financial item in the hands of a human being does not mean that their psychology becomes magically different. Their fears, their desires, their greed does, stays the same. So what creates these repetitive events, no matter what happens, what market you move to, you'll find the same thing because it's the same human race trading it and it's the same psychological um, and emotional dynamics that move the people. Just because a person stops trading stocks and then goes to trading Forex doesn't mean that in Forex the person is more disciplined than they were in the stock market. So if they're more susceptible to being fearful, being greedy, making mistakes in the equity market, they're going to make the same mistakes. They're going to be the same to have the same level of greed, the same level of fear in Forex. You can they can travel around the world. They can even go out of space. And if there's something to trade out of space, you're going to find this very same repetitive cycles. Now, this activity shows up the same way in every market. Now, last point, time frame. Just because you are fearful as a trader doesn't mean that if I change your time frame, you magically stop being fearful. If you are a greedy trader, in the five minute time frame, you're gonna be a freaking greedy trader in a daily time frame. Do you understand what I'm saying? Changing the time frame doesn't change anything. Changing the market doesn't change anything. As long as you have the same psychological pull, push and pull, the same emotional driving items at work, you're gonna see the same patterns, the same events, the same risk reward ratios, nothing is going to change. All right. And if it seems like it changes, that's all in your mind. It's the same. So I know I've answered this. I've beat a dead horse here, but I want to make one final point. I don't care what market you trade. I don't care whether you're short term, intermediate term, long term. You hear what I teach you will be applicable in whatever you do, wherever you are. Do you understand? Whatever market, whatever time frame, it's applicable. And I don't know how else to get that message driven in because I get that question a hundred times a week, but I'm hoping this will solve it. That's why I want to beat that horse dead, you know? All right, cool. Next question. <laughs> All right. Um, Amir's asking, um, Amit is asking, what do you do for confidence in trading? Well, um, first of all, it's a good question. Confidence is a byproduct of something. This is the first and most important thing you have to understand about confidence. You can't achieve confidence directly. If you chase confidence, confidence runs away from you. Confidence does not like to be chased. Confidence comes to you after you have earned confidence. Confidence is the byproduct of doing 
something the right way more often than not and getting the proper results more often than not. And confidence automatically flows. You can't be a crappy trader who loses nine times out of every 10 and sometimes 10 times out of every, every 10 and say, okay, but how do I, how do I become confident? Dude, you got to become a better trader, <laughs> right? You have to, and in order to first become a better trader and confidence comes to the better trader automatically, right? It's a byproduct of becoming better. Before you can become a better trader, you have to become a better you. And this is what a lot of people miss traders. They want to stay the same. I want to stay the same me that I am right now. I am undisciplined. I am ill-informed. I, I am, I am undereducated and I'm certainly undertrained. I have very minimal experience. Now I want to take that person and go into the most competitive market in the world, the financial market, and I want to take money from people. Really? Like, let me ask you something. What freaking planet do you live on? You want to take your undisciplined, untrained, ill-informed, Ill lack of experience self and go into the most competitive market in the world where some of the brightest minds in the world s operate with billions of dollars and their only object is to take your money, but you want to take their money? No, 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 no. Life doesn't work that way. You have to become a better individual first. You have to become more disciplined. You have to become more educated. You have to become more informed. You have to become more trained. You have to become more experienced. Then you take that better version of yourself into the market and then you will get better results. But everybody wants to stay the same and get results. I want to stay who I am, but I want the results of someone else. And another thing, you think you can buy this. So you think there's a shortcut to become a better, becoming a better you. You think that you, that there's no work, that there's no sacrifice, that there's no overcoming obstacles, that there's no process. There's no building experience. You want it now. You want the microwave version of mastery and expertise. And I'm here to tell you traders, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist here with me. Listen, if you can't get it with me like that, you can't get it anywhere. And I know how egotistical that sounds. But listen, I've been at this game for 40 years. All right, 36 of those years professional. And I will tell you, I'm the reason, how many people in this room? The reason this live has how many, there's 211 people in the English room. That's freaking ridiculous. Do you understand? 211 people in this room right now and you know why that's not 20,000 people because I'm the one who tells you this takes time I'm the one that tells you it's not gonna happen overnight I'm the one tells you that you can't buy it so that you're better Monday morning life doesn't work that way I tell it to you like it is and so while there's only 211 people I appreciate you for recognizing that this is what the world needs it's not it's not this message that it's, that it's a, that, that you can become wealthy and rich with a little bit of money and no knowledge. All right. That's just not real. And I will never in my life, you will never hear me preach that. And you will never hear me say that. And I'm content to have 200. Hey, 215. I'm content. <laughs> All right. My opinion of Ethereum, um, Iman is asking, Oliver, future of Ethereum, cryptocurrency Ethereum, uh, next 10 years, will it last the next decade? Um, can I tell you in the next decade? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it might. I. What I will tell you is that Ethereum has... And, and, and I, I think I'm supposed to tell you this. I think I'm supposed to tell you, guys, I have a truckload of Ethereum. And I'm more of a Bitcoin maximalist, but I just accumulated so much Ethereum before I understood the true value of Bitcoin. And now I have almost a tax issue. Um, 
and and so I just have a truckload of Ethereum, and I just have to be honest with you because I don't want. I think I'm legally supposed to tell you that. So, with that in mind, with me being a big owner of Ethereum, I will tell you that I am not overly pleased um, with how Ethereum is run personally. Um, I do, do not, I know that a lot of things that are wrong in the cryptocurrency space are born from Ethereum. I have an issue with that. Uh, I have an issue that the policies of Ethereum continue to change. So there's no certainty as to whether this is the way it's going to be for the next 10 years or when are they going to change it again? Which fork is it now? Where are we moving from proof of work to proof of stake now? Like, all right, what does that mean? And like, when it comes to something I want to store my life work into, I don't want you freaking changing it all the time. I don't need it changing. I don't need you to improve it. I don't need you to fix it. For Christ's sakes, goals the same for 6,000 years. It served as the most secure base layer form of money for the entire world for 6,000 years. And it changed how many times? Zero. Listen, don't mess with if you want this to be the monetary base layer of the world, stop freaking playing with it. All right. Let it let it build some roots. It doesn't even know what it wants to be. Now, that's the negative side of it. And the fact that it's basically run by a small group of big owners that own still I think they started off owning 80 something percent of the of the of the float. Now they own 60 plus percent of it. Listen, I have operated in a world where a small group of people control the vast majority of the supply and they pay for certain marketing to the masses so that the masses push up the limited supply, which automatically puts pushes up their 60 or 70 percent. And they always make policies that benefit the 60 or 70 percent of the insiders that own everything. That's Ethereum. All right. I'm sorry. That's what it is. And I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. That's not what I signed up for here because I've had that for 40 years. That's nothing special, nothing new, same thing. It's a freaking trade, all right? Bitcoin's not a trade. So when you ask me, Bitcoin is life, Bitcoin is freedom, Bitcoin is, is the base layer of the future of the world's future monetary system. It is gold 2.0 and beyond. It's way more than that, but that's the easy way to understand it. That's not Ethereum. Now, another thing is so the question is do i think it's going to last well if it gets past what i think will be a regulatory onslaught that is coming and it is going to if it doesn't hit ethereum directly i believe it's going to hit ethereum indirectly because the regulators have the greatest degree of problems with the things that ethereum gives birth to do you understand and so if Ethereum is the mother of the things that have the most problems in a space, you have to imagine that they're going to hit the source a little bit. So I think there's regulatory uncertainty is much higher with Ethereum and especially the things built on top of Ethereum, whether they're securities or not. I think that's coming. And I think that next year you're going to see that come in a very, very big way, whether things stay the way they are for the next 10 years is really going to be dependent on that. All right. But there's a lot of question marks and a lot of uncertainty into, into next year. So what I'm telling my crypto uh, followers, my, my Bitcoin trading club members is this surge. And I do believe we're going to get a surge in Ethereum. Um, this surge, I'm going to start migrating over. I'm sorry if I've offended the Ethereum people out there. I'm just giving you my my view, my thoughts, my opinion. And don't come at me because I'm practically a Bitcoin maximalist. So um, if you don't want to get punched in the face, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing you. But um, it is what it is. All right. All right, sir, if you uh, if you want to put a single line 
for a new trader to his journey to profitability and make a living out of that, what the line would be. I don't know what you mean. A random by a line. If you want to put a single line for, I think what that's an old term. What's your line? Wow. That's dating back to the 1920s, 1930s. I actually use it in the beginning of my trading life just because of the things I read. Like your line is your amount of money. I think that's what you mean. What an old term. Wow. Okay. Um, what amount would you say is necessary? I think this individual is asking um, to make a living. I think that, first of all, I think you need to be in six figures, to be honest with you. Um, and I know that's going to disappoint a lot of people. But um, listen, it takes money to make money in this world. And all of the people who are willing to lead you in a disingenuous, intellectually dishonest way, will tell you otherwise. This, I don't know about other planets in other solar systems. We have yet to do intergalactic travel, right? But until then, I will tell you how it is on this Earth, on this planet, in this solar system. It takes money to make money. And anyone who tells you not, I would run in the opposite way. It's just the way this, our system is set up. All right. Less and less, though, I agree with that. Less and less as more decentralization happens with information and knowledge and power and access. I get it. But still, in the financial markets, small money makes you do the wrong thing. It forces you to be irresponsible. It forces you to be frightened and scared when you should be bold. You understand? encourages the bad habits it makes it more difficult to become a master trader if your money is small and if you need it and you can't possibly lose it that's even worse this put it this way would you give your life savings over to someone who's scared i'm scared i'm gonna lose this would you give your life savings over to that person? No. But when you give it to yourself and you're like that, you're giving your life savings to someone who's scared. Why would you do that? If you wouldn't give your, your life savings to a professional, even a professional who says, I'm scared of losing your money, I would run in the opposite direction. I don't care how professional the person is, but you do it with yourself. So it's the same. Right. You can't trade with scared money. You can't trade with a little bit of money. You can't show up to a gunfight with a freaking toothpick and think you're going to win. It's not not going to happen. Not on this planet in this solar system. Maybe another one if we find it. But this one doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. You need six figures. I start each trader off with fifty thousand dollars and that's just training level. That's not enough. They need to get to hundreds of thousands. I would say that um, $250,000, now this is in buying power. So that's in today's world, that's not very difficult to get. I give that out like hotcakes. I've got hundreds of traders that have access to $250,000. All right. And so I'm talking about buying power. I'm not talking about necessarily the cash you need. So... A person in a regular brokerage account would need, in order to have 200000 they need a $100,000 account. If they want $100,000 to trade with, they need a $50,000 account, right? So, you know, traditional retail would give you, well, I think they give you four to, four to one now. I haven't just, the retail industry guys, I'm just not in. But, all right, so you get four to one. So, if you want 200000 you need $50,000. All right, that's not out of the ballpark for some people, for a lot of people, but not some people. But in my world, I provide that for them. All right. And but listen, most businesses fail for lack of capital throughout the entire world. Most traders fail for being undercapitalized. All right. And that's the truth. Now, some people say, but Oliver, what about with options or whatever? Listen, in the equity market, there's a 92% failure rate of people who try to do this for a living. In the options, it's like 99%. 99.9%. Futures, 99.9%. So you're, it's really 
It's really bad in those areas. All right, guys. How to stop over trading. All right. How to stop over trading. Um, just stop. <laughs> like, guys, the answer is embedded in your question. Oliver, how do I, st I'm banging my head up against the wall. How do I stop my, my head from hurting? Stop banging your head against the wall. So this is pretty simple. Where is the point that you feel that you're over trading? All right. Is that five, more than five trades, more than 10, whatever it is, draw a line in the sand and vow to yourself that today I won't trade beyond this point. Then take it day by day, just like someone who's an alcoholic or someone who's trying to smoke, trying to stop smoking or someone on a diet. Let me take my diet one day at a time. Got through that day. Now, tomorrow's enough. I'm going to try to get through this day and you do it one day at a time. Now, I will say something on the profit side. Some people kick into overdrive in trading when they had a profit and then lose the profit and they kick into overdrive in an attempt to gain the profit. This is a mistake that you have to really watch watch for. Number one, you have to have a profit amount that you're willing to change gears with. So let's say that that amount is $300 for the sake of um, uh, for the benefit of simplicity, right? So once you hit a $300 gain, you must have something in your plan that says, I now go home with one, with no less than $150 to be up $300 and to lose it all is to be a freaking idiot to be up $300 and lose not only all of the $300 gain, but then to go negative 300, which means you had a $600 turnaround, you shouldn't even be allowed, all right? The honor and the privilege to ever walk into a financial market again, ever. Not only is this being an idiot and being stupid, it is the highest level of irresponsibility. How? It's hard enough to become profitable. How is it that you become profitable and you throw it in the garbage? Like I would never give you a, I wouldn't give you a half a penny of my money. I wouldn't give you a Satoshi. Do you understand how small a Satoshi is right now? It won't stay small, but do you understand how small it is? I wouldn't give you one single Satoshi because I know that if you can take $300 and turn it into a negative $300, you can take 3000 and turn it into negative 3000 and you can take 30000 and turn it into negative 30000 and you can take 3 million and turn it into negative 3 million those zeros at the end of those numbers those extra zeros don't change you do you understand you are dangerous and i want you away from me period so here's my point. You must have something built in your trading plan where you have a cutoff. If that's 300 and then your cutoff is half of that, meaning I can continue trading. But if I lose, I can only lose 150 from now. And then let's say you have to have a next level. Let's say you bring gains up to 500 and at 500, you now can have to go home with 300. And this is how you control yourself. These things things traders are these rules become habit forming and they build responsibility the problem is that the vast majority of people out here are trading rule less there's anarchy in their trading which ultimately means there's anarchy in their life i can tell what kind of person you are just by how you trade i can tell if you're responsible I can tell if you're disciplined. I can tell if you keep your promises to your kids, to your spouse. I can tell all these things. It's built into what you do in the heat of the moment in the market. Because the market is nothing more than a replica, a minuscule replica of life. You go into the market, you go into life. You go into the market every day, you wake up and you go into life every day. 
You have to protect yourself in the market. You've got to protect yourself in life. You got to look for opportunities in the market. You look for opportunities in, in life. You got to, you have to take advantage and sometimes realize your gains in the market. You got to know when to stop and, and, and take your gains and enjoy the roses and take a vacation. And you got to know when to do that. You got to know when to cut. You got to know when to cut a troublesome stock to cut it out of your life. You got to know when to cut a troublesome person out of your life. You got to know how to end a, a toxic relationship. I've got a toxic relationship with this trade. I got a toxic relationship with this person. What is the difference? The precept, the same precepts, the same things, the same qualities, the same characteristics that make for being a good a, a, a good responsible person is the same for being a good responsible trader. It's the same freaking qualities. There's no difference. You can't become more disciplined in your trading and not become more disciplined in your life outside of trading. How? Like, what is this discipline say? Okay, I've worked for you in trading. Oh, wait a minute, you're stopped trading? Okay, my time's off. Let me know when you come back to trading. I'm not being disciplined for you anymore. Do you think that's the way it works? It doesn't have a nine to five. Discipline is universal. If you, if you become disciplined in one corner of your life, it's all in all four corners of your life. And this is what makes trading spiritual. Because you're really, the market is neutral. Microsoft trades the same way for you as it does for me, as it does for Warren Buffett. There's no difference. So it's not, the market is neutral. The, the things that are different are you, me, and Warren Buffett. That's what makes our results different. So what you get from the market is totally dependent on who you are, who you are. You understand? And people don't want to improve who they are. Think about how many people think about how many people sign up for new gym memberships at the beginning of the year and don't do anything. Nobody wants to change. Nobody wants to change who they are. They say it, but very few people do. Most people would rather say Oliver's training is bad. I, I did not improve, so now I'm over here. That They would rather do that than say, I did not work on myself. But I will tell you this. I will tell you this. That at the end of the day, if you're going to make progress, you've got to ultimately stand still. You're going to have to stop moving, stop changing, Stop flip-flopping. Stop switching. Stop buying another book. Stop getting another course. Stop moving to another platform. Stop searching for another mentor. Stop looking for another seminar or another program. And you're going to have to one day stop the search. You're going to have to dig your heels in and start gaining some roots right where you are. Because you know what? You're going to realize and if you're lucky, you will realize this. Many people don't. That wherever you go, there you are all over again. At a certain point, you got to realize I'm running from myself. That I am bad everywhere I go. And what's the common denominator? All the places are different, but I'm the same. And I'm getting the same results no matter where I go. So... I want this to ring in your ear forever. Wherever you go, there you are again. So if you don't like what you're getting wherever you go, then it's you. You better change you. And that's what's beautiful about this game called trading. It is a game of self-discovery and self improvement and ultimately self-mastery because if you ever hope to have any degree of market mastery you're going to have to have some degree of self-mastery first it doesn't work in the reverse i was having this conversation with my traders today 
that nobody wants to change first and then get results. People say, well, you know what? If you give me results, then I'll start working on change. How, how does life work? What planet do you live on? Wait, pay me first, then I'll do the work. Really? In, in what freaking world? In what lifetime? In what life? Where do you live? Like what? Am I watching a movie right now? What movie do you live in? What movie am I watching? The heck is what kind of Disney shit is this? Like, dude, you you have to put something out before you get something back. You don't sit back and say that's the problem with a big portion of the world's population is that things have moved to the point where people want first. How do you get first before you give first before you you put forth something out first? If you go to a park and there's a swing there in the park, right? And you want the swing to come to you. Don't you have to push the swing first? Then you get the swing coming back to you. No, people want the swing to come back to them first. I'll push when you come to me. Like, like dude, I can't help people like that. I, I, I'm so baffled. I like, I sometimes scratch my head and be like, what, what book was, what, who taught you when you were a kid how life was? And can you get me a copy of the book that they read? Like, what book did your parents read? I want to see that book where you were taught this and like that this is the way to get ahead in life. You get first like you don't work first. You don't work on yourself first. You don't become better first. You don't become more disciplined. You don't become more seasoned. You don't first work on becoming more educated, more informed. Like you don't change you first to become better. And then you take the better you into the world. Like that's not what you were taught. Like, whoa. So I don't know what book your parents were reading. You know, because you know how new parents always kind of read books on childhood. Yeah, we're having a kid. I did that. I bought books on that. Then I threw them out, man, after the first one. <laughs> All right. Mm. That's a good one. Pro Day Traders asking, who was your mentor? Guys, um... I wish I had mentors. I can't say that I did not learn things in little pieces from people throughout the years, but remember, I started in 1981. My first trade is in 1981. There was nothing. There's no internet, there's no courses, there's no seminars, there's no books, there's no articles, there's nothing. Guys, the, first of all, equity trading wasn't even the thing. It was bonds. It was bonds were the dominant thing when I first started. Like equities were like, eh, you're interested in equities? You're interested in stocks? Like for what? It didn't, the, as we moved, I started kind of at the right time because we we're on the end of that bond thing and equities exploded in the middle of the 1980s. But even when you got hired on Wall Street, nobody wanted to go to an equity desk like that. What was that? It was all about bonds. And remember in this, I don't remember, I'm, I'm talking to you like you're my age, but in the 70s, the market was trapped and people thought that it would never break 1000. So if you go back to charts of the Dow or the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average during the 70s, you'll see this flat market. I mean, you'll see it drop and then come back. It, it would double, it would drop to 500 and come back to 1,000, drop to 500, come back to 1,000. So, you know, you could play it that way, but no one ever thought that it would ever break. Everyone thought that 1,000 was the ceiling. So it's like, this market has no upside. Like, why do I want to be here? Now, at, in contrast, bonds, we're, we have been in a 300-year bull market in bonds, 300 years. Bonds have been going up for 300 years all the way from interest rates going to zero. So the way you have to look at bonds is in reverse to the interest rate. So now bonds yield zero. So we've gone is almost, a, you can go negative, which some bonds are now negative. Over $100 trillion in bonds are negative, if not more. 
But so you can pass zero, but not by that much. So there's not much more movement up. So think of bonds in reverse. Interest rates drop, bonds are going up, right? Now we've gone from 40% interest, 30%, 20%, 15, 10, 5, and all the that's 300 years of bonds going up, all the way to zero now. So the future for bonds is zero. People thought that equities had reached their peak at 1,000 in the 70s. So nobody, everybody was a bond trader. The junk bond era, everybody was bonds. So I came into the equity world when nobody wanted equities. Nobody was interested in that. You were at the bottom of the totem pole if you got involved in equities. It was like people assumed like, damn, did you flunk out of school or something? Like if you were in a Wall Street firm on an equity desk, it's like, did you did you graduate at the at the bottom of your class? What happened? <laughs> what happened to you? This was always the case with equities, even all the way back in the 1920s and 30s, when the way you traded equities was to go to a bucket shop like an old OTB, if you're from New York, you know what the old OTBs were. Like that was where the low level gamblers bet two dollars on bet two dollars on IBM. But can you give me twenty dollars for my two dollars? Like bonds were for gentlemen. Top hat. You know, not equities. It's only in the ninth. 80s, mid 80s, late 80s into the 90s, 2000s, equities came on top of bonds, right? And so are we at the end of the equity market boom, like we're at the end of the bond? I would say closer to the end than the beginning. What are we at the beginning of? You know, somebody type it for me. So if we're we're at the end of the 300 year bond run, if we're closer to the end in the equity run, right? Equities came into existence 1600s. I think 1600s. Am I right with that? No. No. I mean bonds came into existence in the 1600s. Equities a couple hundred years later, or am I right? No, maybe equities in the 1600s as well. Like w w it started in Portugal, right? The fractional ownership of the of the of the voyages, and they would oversell the voyages, so they would sell 400 <laughs> percent. But the future is Bitcoin. That's a baby. That's 12 years old. It's it it cracks me up when people say, but Bitcoin's a bubble. No, idiot. The bond market's a bubble. That's 300 years old. Gold, 6,000 years old. That's bubble. What are you talking about? Like, that's like saying LeBron James was a bubble at 12 years old just because he was great. At even 12 years old, he was great. All right. LeBron James is 12 years old. He's topped out. Are you kidding me? Dude, Apple's been running for 44 years. What are you talking about? Microsoft's been running almost 46 years. Amazon's been running 24 years. Google's been running 22 years. What are you talking about? 12 years. What, what, what world do you live in? And let me tell you something about this word bubble. Do you, there's a technical term for a bubble that once it's burst, it's gone forever. That's what a bubble is. The tulip bubble. That Tulips never became a thing anymore. When a bubble bursts, it's over forever. It doesn't keep coming back. How, how, that's the, the actual definition of it's not a bubble anymore. If something crashes 85, 90% and comes back, that's living proof. Whoa, I thought it was a bubble. It's not a bubble now. That's what Amazon did four times. But when Amazon crashed 95% and came all the way back, 
people who know the definition of a bubble say, okay, we thought it was a bubble. It's not a bubble now. Like you bubbles don't come back, guys. If someone says that they they're not intelligent enough to know what the financial definition of a bubble is. And just because it's high or up a lot doesn't mean it's a bubble. Imagine calling Apple a bubble in 1997. Just because from its price in 19, no, 1992, when it was 12 years old, it was up tremendously higher from its IPO price in 1980. But imagine calling Apple a bubble in 1992. Ridiculous. It's the future. Okay, back to your questions, guys. Um, zero risk with Bitcoin in the long term. Um, I would say nothing has zero risk. But I would say that based on historical numbers, that it has the lowest, one of the lowest risks. People associate volatility with risk. But that's a negative view. I mean, volatility is positive if played the right way, right? So a dollar cost averaging plan turns volatility in your friend. You want, the last thing you want to do with a non-volatile asset is dollar cost average into it. That's dumb. But if it's volatile, the dollar cost average wins. The dollar cost averaging method wins. It, it says, okay, volatility. I've just bought you, now go work for me. That's what dollar cost averaging does to volatility. It turns volatility into the employee. You understand? But, um, you know, people associate volatility with risk, but volatility is opportunity. And of course, everything young is gonna be volatile. I mean, Amazon was extraordinarily volatile in the beginning years. Wow, I traded it. That thing would go up $80 in an hour and then crash back to 15. I said, the thing was just at $80 and now it's at 15. Like you have no idea what volatility is. If you traded stocks during the dot-com bubble, whew, oh my God. Talk about volatility, this is, Bitcoin's nothing compared to that. You know, how to overcome fear by becoming good. <laughs> you got to become good. You see, fear, guys, in trading is not necessarily bad. Fear is a protective mechanism. It's misplaced psychological fear that becomes our problem. It's the fear that's manufactured by the mind, right? So, for instance, I'll tell you a story. My traders know this story, so they're going to be bored, but I know I have people here that are not my traders, right? So I'll tell you a story. I have twin girls. They're, they're, they're 15 now, but you know, when they were little, um, they went, they had the, they had for one year, they had the same class, right? They're very little. And, um, they would come back sometimes with the same, um, assignment at night. And one of my, uh, and one night there was this assignment, they had to draw, it was around Halloween, and they had to draw what they were going to be at Halloween and bring it back to school the next day. So one of my twin girls is more talented drawing than the other, right? Just naturally so. And so that one, she drew some really scary outfit. Right, this, and then she comes running to me, crying, bawling, like f shaking. And I'm like, "Baby, what? What is the matter? What? What happened?" And she says, "Come look." And she brings me to her own drawing, and she's scared of it. She's like, "Get it away, Daddy! Get it away!" I'm like, "Baby, you drew that. It, that's your creation. You did it." <laughs> and that's what you do. You draw these mental pictures in your mind of all the bad things that can happen and then you start oh my god i'm scared it's your freaking creation your drawing you drew it 
What are you scared? Mo that's the fear that you have to conquer. You have to conquer the fear of mentally creating something and then being scared of it. But what if that's the number one, that's the two words that tells me you're suffering from that fear. But, but that's another word. But what if, what do you mean what if? Stop worrying about things you're picturing in your mind and just look at what's happening right now. So what's happening right now is that this is suggesting a buy because of this. But Oliver, what if that means the person has painted already a negative picture of something bad happening and now he wants to bring me daddy, daddy, come look at this. What if what what, what is this I'm like you created that that doesn't exist yet. I'm telling you what exists right now is a buy. You're telling me what exists in your mind. And you want to give the allegiance to your drawing of reality and not reality? This is the fear that we must conquer. And I'm constantly putting my trader's face into this fact. And, and I won't let them go. I said, you just created this in your mind. Now, what do you want to give your money to? Your drawing or what the market is saying is real right now? So which one is it going to be? I don't let them go, you know? I don't let them go. <laughs> ah. What platform do I use for trading? We use um, a platform called Sterling Trader Pro. It's a professional platform. It is, now when I use the word platform, a lot of people, especially in Latin America, platform and broker is identical to them, but it's not in the professional world. Your platform, you can connect to any clearing firm or brokerage firm in the professional world. So Trading Sterling Pro is not associated with a specific broker. It is a trading platform that you pay for. Now, where you want that connected to is up to you. And if they don't have the connection, then they don't. But um, tr professional trading firms, use these type of platforms. They don't use the generic ones that are created by brokers, all right? Uh, those are built to know all of your actions, to record all of your keystrokes. They know every single stop point. They know your intention. They're recording everything, everything. Every symbol you type, every buy, what you do. It's like analytics on Google, <laughs> all of your searches, everywhere you go, what you're interested. Google knows more about you than you know. It knows what mood you're in by what you search. It knows what you've become instantly interested in by your searches, by the videos you pull up on YouTube. You understand? Um, it knows more about how you feel, what you're thinking right now, what you're interested in, what you want to do with your life. You don't even know those things. People say, what do you want to do with your life? I don't really know, but Google knows. <laughs> and your broker knows too. Your broker knows everything about your, your activity. Can all the gover countries, governments ban Bitcoin together for any threat of quantum computers and BTC? Well, put it like this. All right. Um, Bitcoin cannot be regulated. Right. The reason why is because it is a peer to peer network of nodes connected all over the world, millions actually. It's stated that it's thousands, but it's really millions. And so how would you shut every single computer down? You would have to try to shut every computer down in the world. You would have to shut the world's internet down. And now the Bitcoin blockchain is operating via satellite out of space in the event that the internet goes down on planet Earth. So how do you do that? 
It's the ultimate cockroach. You can't do it. You understand? It's impossible. It would be like, how do we cut off the air for the human race? You can't do it. And if you manage to do it in this area and then you go to another area, then they turn their computers back on in that area. It's just impossible. You can't do it. You can regulate the on-ramps to Bitcoin. That can be regulated. So what's an on-ramp? Coinbase is an on-ramp. Um, you know, uh, Robinhood is an on-ramp. PayPal is an on-ramp. Cash App is an on-ramp. You, the way you access though the firms that offer you to on that on ramps you, that can be regulated. They can be regulated, and they are for the most part. Many, not all, but they are regulated. That's what can be regulated. The on ramps, but Bitcoin itself will continue to tick tock every, here's another block, tick tock another block, tick tock. Do you know that every 10 minutes on average, Bitcoin becomes more invincible, stronger, longer, more powerful, every 10 minutes. So while you discuss over an hour whether Bitcoin is real or not, it had six, it added six blocks to itself. It got six blocks stronger, six blocks longer, six blocks more invincible. While someone writes a negative article and they spend two hours and, and a half writing a negative article, do you know how stronger Bitcoin became in that two and a half hours? Every moment that it doesn't die, it gets bigger, stronger, longer, more powerful, more invincible. And it doesn't ask you anything. It doesn't demand that you use it. Everyone with Bitcoin chose it. Think about it. You didn't choose your currency, but you're forced to use your currency. I'm forced to use dollars to pay my taxes. Bitcoin never forced anything on me. I chose Bitcoin. It's the eighth, no, today, Tesla knocked out Bitcoin. Did you know that? Tesla moved to the eighth most valuable asset in the world. Bitcoin was the eighth mo most valuable asset in the world today, I believe. If I'm not mistaken, guys, today is, right? Yeah. See, Tesla knocked Bitcoin back to nine, but only temporarily and very marginally so. So Bitcoin is worth $1.156 trillion. Tesla's move up today is 1.2 trillion. Doesn't matter to me. My wealth traders and I own Bitcoin and Tesla. Amazon is the biggest holding of my life. Apple is the second biggest holding of my life. Microsoft is the third, and it used to be gold, but I've changed gold for Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is coming for that booty goal. Oh, yeah. Bitcoin's coming for you. Bitcoin's coming for silver, Amazon, Google, Saudi Aramco. It's coming for you, Apple. All of you are older. Well, Tesla's not so much older. When was Tesla's, uh, what is that, guys? When was Tesla's, um, uh, when was Tesla's um, birthday? When was that? What was the birthday there? That's an interesting question, right? Anybody know that offhand? When was Tesla's birthday? What's what? When was Tesla born? Anybody know that? Tesla IPO date. It's really you shouldn't go by the IPO date, really, because that's his first. Uh, That's interesting. So 2010, but it existed before 2010. So yeah, Tesla's older than Bitcoin. Bitcoin's the base, still the baby on the block. Still the baby in the top 10. Um, can you give an example of how to journal? Uh, speaking of that, guys, speaking of that, this is something I want you to try to attend. All right. Uh, I think that I did that right. Yes. How to journal like a pro. 
6.30 p.m. New York time, November 10th. All right, that is coming up. I want you to, um, I want you to make sure you attend that if you can. If you can't, um, it will be, it'll be obviously here's an electronic footprint forever. So you'll catch it on the, uh, but if you catch it live, then, you know, we'll be able to interact a little bit with each other. So make sure you, um, uh, guys, just do me a favor on this live. Can you just hit the like button? All right. And if you didn't like it, hit the, hit the dislike button too. I don't care. Hit that one twice. If you didn't like it, that's fine. That's fine. Hit that one twice. I got them right. Cause if you hit it twice, it undoes the like button. Yeah. If you disliked this session, hit the unlike button twice. If you like the session, hit the like button once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. That's a good question. Oliver, I see, I see that you don't, uh, I see that you don't always take one to one in the opening momentum trading trading. Why? Good question, Danny, and a very sophisticated one, actually. And you're right. Um, I'm going to try to give a very brief answer to this. When you are a novice without skill and experience, you need math to make up for your lack of skill and experience, your lack of consistency, your lack of accuracy. So you must play things like a three to four to one ratio so that your risk is one dollar, but your upside is three or four dollars. Right. But see, the number of opportunities that meet a three to one are very small. So that would be doing a talented trader in injustice by limiting the number of opportunities. When someone's talented, you want to increase the number of opportunities. So let's say, let's, let me give you an example. Um, if you win eight times out of every 10 trades, sometimes nine times out of every 10 trades, then all you have to do is go get to 10 trades and you've got eight to nine winners. Get to another 10 trades, eight to nine winners. Get to another 10 trades, eight to nine winners, right? What do you want to do with that trader? Trade more, please, just trade more. Not trade less. The firm would lose money by letting that trader trade less. You want to trade more. So now, if a trader is not talented, you want them to trade less. So you require three to one. If you want the trader to trade more, you go to two to one, right? Because there are more trades available at two to one than there are three to one. And if you want a trader at two to one to trade more, you go one to one. Now, one to one is okay if you win eight to nine times out of every 10. You understand? So if you lose a thousand dollars and you make a thousand, all right, but out of 10 trades, you win a thousand nine times, 9,000, and you lose a thousand once, now you net 8,000. So that's a one to one. But if a trader is trading one to one and he's accurate 80, eight to nine times out of every 10, you're doing that trader an injustice. So then you go inverse with the trader. Now, for every dollar you lose, make 50 cents. Now that's an inverse relationship. That's not one to one, that's 0.50 to one. Now this, to novices, this is strange, but in the professional world, this is normal. So that every time I lose, I lose $1,000, but every time I win, I win 500. Now let's take do the numbers. I win eight times out of every 10. I win $4,000. So I win 500 eight times out of every 10. So I win, I win $4,000, but I lose 2000 because I lose twice. When I win nine times, I win 4,500. And when I lose, I lose only a thousand. And now you just let that trader go, right? 
and you because the number of trades that trader can do 30 trades to every 10 at a higher risk reward so you're slowing the profits down do you understand it's going to take the trader longer to get 10 trades at one to one than it will at 50 to one so for every 10 trades he can get at one to one he can get 30 trades in at 0.50 to one now do that math and the trader's more profitable with an inverse relationship. It depends on your level of accuracy, where you fall on that mathematical scale. The trader that does not have skill, does not have accuracy, needs three to one, four to one, because math is making up the slack for what the trader doesn't have, all right? All right, guys. You guys are amazing. I'm gonna to have to call it off now, but I really, I wanna, I wanna tell you that I really truly appreciate you being here. Um, I appreciate you showing up. I appreciate the support. Um, guys, listen, seriously, every time I am given the opportunity to um, speak to you, it's something that I, I I really, really do with great honor. I don't take, I don't take this for granted that you show up, that that I can just have a live and have an audience. There are so many people who wish they had that, and I will never take that for granted. So that this is my promise to you. Every time I'm given the ability to grab a mic, I do my best to leave something behind, traders, that you that will hit you a certain way or that you can take with you forever that can be of value to you, at least in your trading life forever, if not your general life as a whole. I hope I've done that here today because I really tried. Um, and if I haven't, I'll try to do better next time. Okay, guys? Um, ciao for now. Trade well. Well, rest up on the weekend and starting Monday, trade well. All right? Bitcoin, you know. You know what to do. Ciao for now, guys. <laughs> Love you guys. Love you. My coffee's cold, but it's still good, though. Love it. Woo! Boom. <laughs>